We're at Catherine Narducci's studio here at her home. This is a separate room in her home, and this is her studio where she does all the paintings. Now, for those of you who don't know, Catherine is a great, great painter and a great artist, but she's also <laughs> one hell of an actor. And Catherine, and Catherine, we, Catherine and I met on Bronx Tale, and I know you must have said this story a hundred times, Catherine, probably a thousand times. But just for the people who don't know and haven't seen the show, haven't seen uh, certain things that you've done, the first thing you've ever done, tell them how it happened. Okay, so I'm going to make a long story short. Well, it's okay. We got a little time. Go okay, ahead. so uh, I was working in the Hunts Point Terminal Market, and I was a closet case actress at the same time. I would buy backstage and go on auditions, and nobody knew. So I was working in the Hunts Point Terminal Market, and the woman, Annabelle, who I worked with, I would always make everybody in the office laugh, and she used to go, ha ha, you should be an actress. Mm -hmm. She did not know that I was acting, going on secret auditions. So one day she comes in with the, the uh, Daily News, and she said, look at this, Robert De Niro's looking for a little boy to play his son. It's an open call, you should take your son. And I said, oh my God, yeah, I'm going to. I went home, I asked my son, do you want to go in for Rob De Niro? He's doing a movie. I just took him on not knowing anything to the address that was there. I took my nine-year-old son and he said yes and he stayed home from school that day. I took him to the audition and he went in and he did his thing. While he was in the audition, I saw all these women coming in that looked like me, walked like me, and talked like me. And I was like, well, what are you here for? Because I could do it by the way they look, I'm right for whatever this role is. Right. So I said to this girl, what, who are you here for? And she said, I'm here for the mom. And I didn't know that it was the mom, Robert De Niro's wife. I right. did not know. So when she came out with my son, uh, I said, could I read for the mom? And she said, are you an actress? I said, not really, but trying to be. And she said, no, honey, you have to be in SAG. The little boy is an open call. The mom isn't. But if we don't find the mom today, call in the morning. We're going to make it an open call tomorrow. Oh, okay. So I, I said, fine. I took my son. We went home. I was getting dressed for work to go to the Hunts Point Terminal Market. And I was debating all morning whether to call. And I decided I'm going to call. So I called up. I said, hey, I was there yesterday. Did you ever find the mom? She said, no. I said, can I come in? She said, yeah, come back. I went back, I put myself on tape, um, and two days later, I get a call. Hi, it's Ellen Chenoweth. Bob wants to know if you can go, if you can come back for the call back. And I was like, who the hell is Bob? And I, I, I really, not that I forgot it, but I didn't realize what the hell she was saying. Right. And I thought, really thought it was my cousin pranking me because I had told my cousin what I did. Right. And she said, oh, this is, you, you came in for um, the movie for Robert De Niro's wife. And he want, he saw your tape, he wants to know if you want to come back for the open, for the callback. And I said, of course, yes. I went down and that's when I met you. Right. You were there, De Niro was there. And I read that day. And when I auditioned that day, I remember Bob said, well, there's a possible chance we might call you back. By the time I got home from that audition, on my answering machine, when we had answering machines, it says, we want you to come back. I went back and I went back and I went back like so many times, as you know, and right. then I screen tested and I got the role. Pretty amazing. <laughs> just like, you know, Woody Allen used to say, 85% of success in life is just showing up. And you showed up, you showed up with your son and then you went and you asked, and then you came back again. They called you. But a lot of people just would have forgot about it. Yeah. But not you. You just came back. And I remember your tape. I remember when Bob and I kept looking at it. Oh, wow. I remember that. And we kept looking at these other uh, actresses who, you know, had a lot of, some had really good credits. And, but you had a, you were the person. You were just so natural. And it was the, Bob, Bob, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think I'm talking out of school here. I think you were Bob's choice from, from the very beginning. Mine too. It was just, there's nobody who's so authentic like she is. And uh, that was it. And wow. you got the call. Wow. Well, I think the reason you show up and the reason you do it, and I was just talking to somebody about this. Right. And you'll know this is true. There are people that 
want to be actors, right? right? They want to be actors. Like, oh, I want to be an actor too. Right. And then there were people who didn't decide. It To me, it's not that you, de- you, you do make a choice that you're going to pursue it, but you are born an actor. You were born with this quality. You were put on this earth and you were born mm-hmm. with it. And you know that there is something inside you that you can't help but you have to do it right. and you have to do it. And there's, it's the only thing that's going to make you really happy in life. You could get a nine to five job and you can make your living. You could pay your bills or have a really good job or do something right. really good. But if you were born to be something like an, of, of an artist, a painter, a singer, an actor, there's always going to be that yearning that's desire right. and you show up because not because you want to, because you have to, you have to when right. you are really meant to be an actor, when you are an actor. Right. And I always tell people, they say, well, you know, I want to be an actor, but I'm really studying law. And I go, you know what? Forget it. Just stay with, <laughs> stay with, be a lawyer. I said, because if you don't, but I want to be an actor too. I go, you don't understand. This business is so hard. Yes. It beats you up so much yeah. that you have to say, I have to do this or I'll die. That's right. Literally, that's how, what I was. I was. I didn't make it till I was 40. 3940, where no no money in the bank, no no health insurance, nothing. Not married, nothing. And I was you have to fly, you have to be willing to fly without a net. That's right. And that's it. That's right. And you have to be willing to and I always say people get frustrated who are actors and that are trying to do it and they don't get work and they're not making it and mm. they get they start getting bitter and they right. start getting complainy and they complain about everything and they're not enjoying the process. And I just think to myself, well, I enjoyed doing it for nobody. And I think even if I didn't get this, I really believe this. I would be happy still doing it in a broken down theater. Right. Not making it because it's something I have to do. You have to do it. I don't want to do it to have an audience or to be famous or anything. I have to do it. So it doesn't matter where I do it as long as I do it. But if I get work and I can do it and get paid, that's where your vocation meets your calling. And then Absolutely. you are twice as blessed. And, you, and you're, uh, you're so right, Catherine. And you're not really, to, to you and to me, we're not really working. It's something, it's fun. That's right. I'm, I'm playing and I'm having fun. That's right. And f- for those of you who don't, pe- the people out there, I mean, 80% of the world, maybe even more, do jobs that they hate. But they have to do it. That's right. And thank God, and I say thank God for them. And like in Bronxdale, the real tough guy is the guy who gets up every day and puts food on the table for his family. That's right. Uh, whether it's a, a man or woman. That's right. So what I say is we're blessed. We are blessed. I'm so blessed. And I, and I know I'm blessed, and I've, I feel even that's a blessing, knowing that you're blessed and being self-aware and realizing right how lucky you are on this planet and how blessed you are. It's a gift. Right. Now, that was your obviously your first big break. What was, would you say was your second big break right after the that? The second break, I mean, I got things. Um, Did The Sopranos come how far after that? Yeah, it was, it was definitely Sopranos. Um, God, uh, in 2000. Right. So in 2000. So we did the, the we finished, I always remember, we, I think we finished the Bronx Tale in February of 2000, uh, in 1993. 93. We finished it. So I was going all those years like Law and Order and right. this and that. And then when I got The Sopranos, right. I was, that was. Um, a big thing. That was a big thing. And I was, I was again blessed with a show like that. And I just always seemed to. I want to say it's luck out also right. to have myself in a position to be on really beautiful quality right, yeah. movies or TV shows. I um, I feel like it's. Unblessed. I know, but I mean, luck to me is luck is when you know it's a classic line. Luck is inspiration, perspiration, and inspiration meet together. I mean, it's opportunity. You know, I mean, I know you say you're lucky, and I always say I'm lucky. But when you work hard at your craft and you're good, you get hired. I mean, the real key to success, as far as I'm concerned, is be really good at what you do and be well liked, and and you can't you can't fail. I I I kind of agree with that because I see a lot of a talent, a lot of 
young talent or older talent that I see them working just as hard and showing up and sometimes they just don't make it. And that's where I call it the luck. That's right. where I call it the luck because right. if you are showing up and you are doing everything that you could and then I'm showing up and I do everything that I could and we're both showing up equally and doing the work, the hard work, but I get it. That's when I call it the luck. The other stuff is the work and the dedication and mm. wanting to be there, but the next, there is luck involved because you luck out. You get it. I mean. Right. I always say, it's not, people go, you got to knock on a lot of doors. I say, well, you got to, it's the person who knocks on the most doors the most often. You know, you just, just keep on trying. That. That's right. So how was the Sopranos experience? That was really great. You know, that was an amazing experience that I'll never forget. Again, I feel so blessed. The people that I worked with were all, you know, a lot of us keep in touch. Some of us don't, but we're all still connected in a special way that, yes. like me and you, I'll never, you'll never lose me. You'll never right. get rid of well, me. I would want to, yes. <laughs> so um, we all stay connected, you know. I'm still very good friends with Vinny Pastor, and yeah. I talk to Drea and, you know, Jamie and uh, Robert Isla, Jamie Lynn Siegel and right. Robert Isla. Johnny V, the guy who played yeah, Ventimiglia, who played yes. my husband, I, I, Michael Rispoli, um, um, Imperioli. Right. You know, they're all good people. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, and it's a wonderful show. Thank I mean, you. great writing, um, and uh, not to say anything down about, but how was it when, when you heard James died? That was that must have hit you hard. Oh my God! It was like. Yeah. It actually felt like somebody told me you know, a family member died. Right. Like, I, I felt so, so sick. I was so, that's a tremendous loss to everybody. It is, it to is. To everybody. He was one of the nicest human beings I've ever met. So. And not only just so humble. Humble. Oh, my God. Yep. Like, and the most generous. The and generous the most guy. generous. Most now, generous. I heard stories. I don't know how true they are. But I, I said, if that's true, I said, if that's true, that is the most amazing thing I ever heard because I never heard of an actor doing that where he took money off his salary and gave it to... Yeah. And that's true. Yes. That, that he gave it to the cast. Yes, he did. So they can make more money. I've never met an actor do that. <laughs> and you know what he did? Our last season, um, I think was uh, 2007, we got on stage at the Emmys and they wanted all of us to take a bow and because it was the last season right and or was it 2009 or seven i forgot but we all fly out to the emmys and we get there and all of a sudden this guy says a uh, security guy or somebody says come on all of you get up and follow us we were in the shrine when we go in the back of the shrine we we where they have the ceremony and he says you know the reason why we're here is james wants to give you all something and he goes, we have, and I, I may be wrong, but I think I'm right. He goes, we have, a, we have in this duffel bag, they had duffel bags, like a million dollars worth of jewelry, of, uh, yeah, jewelry, watches. And we were like, and he goes, and each one of you are going to get a watch that's inscribed and um, comes with a, um, when you get this certificate of um, authent authenticity. Yeah, authenticity. Um, it's gonna have a code and you're all gonna get one. And he gave us gold watches. I got a platinum, a white platinum gold watch. And in the back of it, ironically, it says, rest in peace, Tony. Wow. That's what he had engraved in it. And he bought all those. He bought everybody a gold watch. Some got, you know, different yeah. watches, but we all got a gold watch. I mean, I don't know any actor who does that. Who does that? Who does that? He bought everybody on set mopeds. Mopeds. Scooters. Everybody got a scooter, a moped. Wow. Yeah. No one of a kind. One of a kind. One of a kind. And I didn't know him well. I did know him, but I didn't know him well like you guys did. But every time I would meet him, he would 
just always come over to me. Hey, Jazz, how are you? And we have to work together one day. I'd love Aww. to work with you. Just not an air, you know, not this air, because he was like, he was like a, a, an icon. Really? You know, and just so nice and said, I hope one day we can work together. And, and I was very sad when he passed on. Yes. Uh, but uh, he will be missed. But you know what? He, he left a legacy of great work. That's right. He really did. And uh, so would you say, and then obviously uh, after The Sopranos, I mean, all the other movies, I mean, so many things you've done. Uh, but let's talk about the thing you're doing now with, with me. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's not forget, we're, uh, Catherine and I were in a series called Godfather of Harlem, where she plays Chin Giganti's wife. Olympia. Olympia. And I, and I play Joe, Joe Bonanno. We don't have any scenes together. Well, we can. Mm, yeah, maybe. You don't maybe. know, we may go out to dinner one night, the four of the us. The four of us. You know what? That's not a bad idea. Yeah. That's possible. Me, you, Annabella. And Me, you, Annabella. And Vincent Zanofrio. I play Vincent Zanofrio's wife. That's right. You play Vincent. You played some of the biggest stars' wives. Joe Pesci's wife, Robert De Niro's wife. You know, it was so funny. I um, I played Gandolfini's wife, too, in a, in a film that we did. Um, Michael Raspoli's wife, Michael Imperioli's wife wow. in a, a TV series. Bob produced it. De Niro produced it, Jane Rosenthal. Right. It was a TV series, movie, um, series, um, like three episodes, I think. I right. forgot the name of it. But I played, oh my God, yeah. I played so many people. How, how was it? Work? I mean, Joe Pesci so funny. I mean, to work with Joe, right? You know, I have to tell you, I feel that he, of all the actors that I've ever worked with, surprised me the way he is in real life right. as opposed to who he is right. and who he plays. Right. And I, after I met him, I thought, God, I wish there was a, a film that he can be the lead and really show who he is. Right. Because... I think it would shock the world on yeah, who he's he so is. funny. He's but he's he's funny, but he's also very soft spoken and yes. gentle. Gentle, yes. And you know him a long time, yes, right? Yes, a long, long time. Yeah, but he he would be so I used to you know, when we did the scene when he comes over to the coffin and um he, you know, he prays and he, and he speaks to Cologio, young Cologio, and he just I kept falling asleep because Bob had me in the coffin for 18 hours. I remember you were in that coffin. I kept falling asleep and you would hear me snore. And Joe Pesci would just go, hey, what the fuck? You're going to wake this guy up or what? Hey, hey. And we, we, I, it was the funniest thing. Being directed by Martin Scorsese, Scorsese, not yes. Scorsese, um, uh, unbelievable. Does he talk to the actors a lot or does he just let you do your thing? You were never directed I by Martin? I was Mom? never been in a Marty Scorsese movie. This Never. is a crime. I know, you believe this that? This is a crime. One of my bucket things, but whatever, for whatever reason. Wow, it's a crime. I know. Um, And the funny thing is, he would love you. Did you ever meet him? Oh, yes. I met him oh, a, few, okay. a, a, um, a bunch of times, yes. B being directed by him is like being directed by uh, somebody who just is so happy to show up, right. so happy to be there, right. very chill, right. loves everyone, respects everyone. And gives a nice thing to the set, makes everybody feel. I felt I really identified with him in yeah. a way where I'm still like that. I still, every time I get a script from The Godfather of Harlem, yes. I text Chris Brancato. And I go, thank you. I'm so happy. Right. And he must be thinking, well, what this girl like? What do you? <laughs> She's doing this a long time. This is what she no, does. It doesn't matter. I'm like a right. kid. I love it. I, it. I, I, I just love it, and I yeah. appreciate going to work, and I'm happy. Right. And meeting Marty, the per, a person who I see has that same feeling right. as I do, felt so good to be there because right. you know, a lot of times you'll be on set. People who do it a long time, you feel like. They are taking it like, ah, this is another job, no biggie. They're over right, it. Right. They're showing up. Right. That's it. They lost their little sparkle in their yeah, eye yeah. 20 years ago on the last 
thing they did 20 years ago, and right. now they're just showing up. Just I work with up. a lot of actors yeah. sometimes that are like that. Right. And when you find people that are still like a kid and still have that sparkle right. and still have that kid in them that right. are happy to be there, right. we're going to make a movie. You, it just, I love it. And and how is it when you, uh, I, I know so many people love uh, uh, working with Marty, but when you worked with uh, Clint Eastwood, now that must have been, now how is Clint as approached with actors? Clint Eastwood, okay, so I worked with Clint Eastwood on Jersey Boys. Um, Clint Eastwood, when I first met Clint Eastwood, this was so funny, I auditioned, I did a self-tape. For Clint Eastwood? Yeah, so I didn't meet him yet, and yes. I got hired from the tape. Right. So I went to set, um, it was in LA, I, I went to set, got, it was my first day of work, and I got all dressed up into character, and it was a day that I would look really nice because I was going to court, so we had, you know, it was a period piece, right. so I had this hat on, they made me look really nice, and they took me to set, and I remember being on the um, the golf cart, going from there, getting, right. and I was on the set, I was like, I can't believe I'm going to meet fucking Clint Eastwood. Yes. So I get to the set, and they were all going, all right, Clint's in the car, Clint's in the car. He'll be here in five minutes, Catherine, and I'm like, oh, my God. And then all of a sudden, they're like, Clint's in the elevator. And I look at the elevator. It's going one, two, three, four. Five, <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> So that's how I met no, Clint wow. Eastwood. What a great story. But, but the one thing he does do, and I can confirm it's truth, he doesn't yell action, and he does not yell cut. It's a very yes. zen set. Yes. Everybody that works for him, from the DP to the sound, they've all been with him. They know how the machine... Right. The Clint Eastwood machine works. And he does only a few takes. Boom, boom. Oh, he does a few takes, but the takes go on forever. Right. Like, because he don't yell cut, so me and you were working, we're like, oh, yeah, but now we know the scene's over. And nobody's yelling cut, so I'm like, so what? Uh, you keep, you improvise until there's nothing left. I mean, there was one time I improvised in a set on a scene, and I felt like it went on for 10 minutes more, wow. and then finally I was just like, I don't have anything else. Right. <laughs> like, I just stopped. Right. Because wow. nobody ever said cut. Yeah. Some, I, I worked with Billy, uh, William Freakin, who's a great director, Billy Freakin, and he doesn't, he doesn't like to say action because he thinks action makes the actors go action. Just, right. just start. Just start. Was he ever an actor? You know what? I don't, I don't think Billy was. See, I sure. think that's why Clint does it, because he was an yeah. actor. Yeah. So I think he knows, like, yeah. you know, ease in it and ease out. Ease out. It's like in the actor's studio. You know, when you start the scene, you start the scene, and right. they just sit down, and they just go whenever, you, whenever you're ready. Right. And then you just go, and whenever you feel Catherine like... Catherine and I were members of the actor's studio. Yes, we are proud members we're of proud the actor's studio. proud members of the actor's studio in New York. That is a hard thing. How many times did you audition, or you got... I got in, yeah. You cheated. <laughs> yes, you I cheated. <laughs> yeah. I auditioned three times. Three times. Oh, that's pretty good. Geraldine Page auditioned 12 times. Wow. Geraldine Page. Wow. No, but that was back then. I mean, now, well, it's still hard. It's I still love hard. Geraldine Page. I love Geraldine Who's Page. Who's your favorite actor? My favorite actor? Of all time. <sighs> wow. Well, it's, I, I don't know if I can say my favorite I've had, I got a bunch of favorites. Obviously, Brando, just, we just saw Brando uh, a couple of nights ago. We saw this, we saw uh, Street Corner and Desire again. I haven't seen that in a long time. Wow. And I watched it. And you did ever see it? Yeah, yeah. And I just really watched it. I was like, damn, holy smokes. It was like, it just, it was incredible. 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 My favorite movie, and my favorite movie is a lot of big stars' favorite movie. And I, I think it's Marty's favorite movie, too. And that's on the waterfront with Marlon Brando, wow. Eli Kazan. Yeah. I think he said that was his favorite movie. I know that's been my favorite movie forever. Uh, for those of you who never saw On the Waterfront with Brando, it's uh, pretty amazing. So I would have to say Brando. Rod and Steiger I, blew me away in that too. Yes, Rod Steiger was incredible in that. Um, I, I, I would say, but now, if it's, it's the people I admired when I was young, obviously when I saw... De Niro in uh, Mean Streets, I was like blown away by yeah. that. I mean, I was blown. And then to work with Bob, and he played my father, and my real father, Lorenzo. So 
I, I, but then there's some actors who I love that I can't say who's better than who. My favorite is Peter O'Toole, who I wow. just love Peter O'Toole. Uh, I, just, I just thought Peter O'Toole was on another planet. You know, uh, just some great actors, man. Uh, today, there's some wonderful actors. I, I, I like Denzel a lot, uh, Morgan Freeman. Uh, and who do you, who's your favorite actress? Wow. My favorite, I... Joan Allen. Uh, Joan Allen is like, whew, wow. Uh, wow. I don't know if you ever saw Joan Allen. I love Joan Allen. Joan Allen is... Uh, know what I loved her in? It wow. was called The Upside of Things with Kevin Costner. Yes. She was amazing yes. in that. The Ice Storm. Uh, I mean, pretty Yeah. Pretty amazing a a actor, actress. Well, of course, Meryl. Mary, you got to give Meryl credit, man. Meryl you know, Streep. Meryl Streep. I mean, she's so great. Every movie, every movie she does, she's so great that I think people just take it for granted now. Why? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, what we, I think they're saying, well, what are we going to do, nominate her 100 times? Yeah. You know, I mean, she's been nominated 20-something times. She laughs now, I think, when she gets nominated. Like, yeah. She makes jokes and everything. I mean, everything. she's won I don't know how many times. But she, I think people just take it for granted now because she's so great. Right. You know, they say, all right, let's try to find someone else. Right. But but she's like, she's on another planet. I mean, uh, I, were, I directed some wonderful actresses. Uh, Susan Sarandon is, uh, you know, Christine Lottie. Let me tell you something. Another person I, I directed... Absolutely great, uh, uh, Penelope Cruz. Wow. Penelope Cruz is the real deal, man. Like you know, wow. I, I don't know if people know what a great what a great actor she is. She is really great. Wow. Um, you know, it's just as a director, you just say something to some of these actors, and they just do it. You know, they they just do it. Yeah. And another wonderful uh, actress who I worked with twice is Linda Fiorentino. Now, Linda Fiorentino is just... Whatever happened to Linda Fiorentino? Linda, you know, I want to see her more. I want to see her more, too, but I don't, know if she, I don't know if she wants to act anymore, but she's... Amazing actress. Just an amazing actress, you know. And uh, so many things. You know, so many... You know, I, just, I like working with really great people. How do you like working with Forrest Whitaker and... Uh, For, Forrest and, and, Vince, and Vincent... Vincent D'Onofrio. Vincent D'Onofrio. Just, you know, class, man. Yep. Just great actors. Paul Savino, too. Paul you know, Savino. We, we love working together. We love working together. I mean, I tell you, when I watch you guys, um, I was there one day when you all worked, and I was so happy. And right. I said, I want to go see, before COVID, right. you know, when you were allowed to go on the set and right. visit, if you weren't working yeah. that day. Um, actually, I was working that day, and when I finished, they sa I said, what are you doing next? And they said, it's Chaz, Paul Savino, Vincent D'Onofrio in the club. And it was the first, I think it was the, the what well, was the first season, of course, but the scene you all had in the club yes. where you had a sit down or something. We had a sit down. And yeah. I remember saying, looking at that on camera going, it's like three icons. Almost. Well, thanks. Like really, it was just fabulous to see the three of you yeah. like that together. Well, so God, powerful. Yeah. Godfather Harlem, I think the first year went great and this year is going to be even better. Uh, they say, and uh, it's a great show. You know what I, I, I find? Here's the differences between good Italian, if you want to say, you know, people who do cliche Italian right. acting, like, hey, oh, wait, and they think right, right. that's how you're, they want to be <laughs> actors because they have an accent. Right, right. I have people that always come up to me, they're like, hey, I'm, look at me, everybody tells me I should be an actor. Oh, hey, oh. And oh, yeah, that <laughs> qualifies you. Right. Just because you're from the Bronx, Chaz Palminteri, right. and you have an accent, doesn't mean that's why you're an actor. Right. You learned your craft. You know the craft. And the thing is, when people come up to me, you know, people always come up to me, and I'll say it again, like, they're like, yeah, put me to Robert De Niro to put me in a movie. I'll go call him right now for yeah, you. Right. Because you have an accent. Right, you could be in a movie. And right. you think you can act. Well, how about this? They go, oh, you're not acting, you're playing yourself. Oh, well, how about that one? They, so I got a great story about that. Yeah. So when I got a Bronx tale, one of my stories that I remember with me and Bob sitting on the bed in between them tweaking lights, he said, you know, I want to tell you, a lot of people are going to tell you, oh, you only got that role because you're just being you. You're not acting, you're being you. Right. He goes, but here's the difference. You're a natural. 
And what that means is, and this is great, I never heard it put this way. He goes, yeah, the difference is, is that when you go to a wedding and you're all at a wedding and you're all being relaxed and you're like, yeah, the bride and groom, your friends, everybody's enjoying themselves, having drinks. And then the camera guy comes around and he comes to you and he says, hey, say something to the bride and groom. What do you do? You get up and you're like, hi, and you start acting different. Right, yes. You're like, I want to just, and you start putting the show on right. and you don't act like yourself. Exactly. You start acting different. The craft is to be in front of a camera and still act like yourself. That's right. That's a craft. That's a craft. That's a craft. It's the hardest, easiest thing you'll ever try. That's right. If that makes sense. It looks the Absolutely. easiest, but it's the hardest. And that, that's true. And the thing is, the reason why, and going back to the frame of you, Forrest, and Vincent, is this. You and Vincent, two Italian-American actors. You bo he's from Brooklyn. You're from the Bronx. The difference is when... People think that they could act because they have an accent. They want to like just come right off the street and onto a set. It's not that. That that is such a craft to a craft. act like. Even though you have the accent, it takes a long time to really know the craft and do what you're doing so right. well. And that's why there's bad movies that portray Italian gangsters. And that's why The Godfather with Pacino and De, and right. De Niro and 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 uh, Bronx Tale. A Bronx Tale with you and De Niro and these are trained actors and that's why they become classic great Italian you know if you want to call them gangster flicks and along with the Sopranos right. everybody knew their craft it's not like some of the shows that come and go and they fail because they hire an American guy to come on and right. try to do a bad imitation right. of an Italian what they think the idea right. of what an Italian gangster would be the old we, we had my friend Dominic Broccoli. He was playing the owner of Geno's. Now, he owned Geno's. His last name was Broccoli? His last name was Broccoli, like the vegetable. My doctor was Broccoli when I was a kid. Oh, really? In Harlem. Well, there you go. A lot of Broccoli's. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now he's playing himself. He's, he owns the restaurant. We, he, all he had to do was say the lines he always says. So we gave him the lines. And he, and he comes out, and Bob says, all right, let's do it. He comes out, and he goes like this to me. He goes, Sonny, do you want some broccoli da or some fruit de ma? And we're like, what the fuck? No, all right, that's it. I mean, he couldn't do it because he thought he had to just act. And you don't have to act. That's the idea. Don't act. And so that's why But it's, don't act doesn't mean don't act. Right. Don't act means be you, but real you. You listen, it takes a long time to get what the hell it means. Right. That's when true. I was in the actor's studio, I remember um, when I was in the actor's studio, I remember I was doing a scene and Estelle paused and said, um, what the hell did she say? I forgot what she said about d don't no, she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I was trying to find the character. She goes, well, what do you mean you're trying to find the character? You're the character. I go, yeah, but I mean, I'm not going to be me while I'm doing it. She goes, why wouldn't you be you? And it became a back and forth thing, and I couldn't understand what she was saying. She made 100% sense. Right. And then it took me about five uh, years being a member of the studio until one day I got up and I did something, and every single thing she said connected in my brain. It takes years to know how to, like, go up on a line and then realize where you are and just take a breath and come right back again. That's right. But you'll see it's not as easy as you think it is. And it's, you know, and, and it's just the rejection is, please. Right. The rejection is just like, I always tell parents, they tell me, please, Chaz, talk to my daughter, my, my son. He wants to be an actor. Please talk him out of it. I know what I, I say to them, Catherine. I say, listen, the business is so tough that don't worry. If they don't have it in them, they'll quit. Because they're going to get beat up so bad and rejected so bad that they don't need their parents not to be on their side. I said, be on their side. Wish them well. To be an oasis for them to go to. Wow. I said, don't worry. If they don't have it here, they'll stop. That's right. And you know what? And they, I said, because only two things could happen, and they're both bad. One, they won't make it, and they'll resent you. Or two, That's right. 
they will make it and they'll resent you. <laughs> That's right, if you don't support them. Right. What a great analogy. I like that. You know, and the other thing is, too, when I taught, I taught two semesters at the School of Visual Arts. I taught first-year directors. They had to take a course in acting. Yes. And the first thing I asked the whole entire class is, but, no, no, I'm lying right now. Wait. I, yes, I had to teach first-year directors how right. to act. But then at the at the end of the class, at the end of the whole thing, they all learned how to act. And then they started saying to me, oh, I think I want to switch. I want to act now. Like a lot of them were like, really? I didn't, they didn't have to be. They could do whatever they want. Right. Next semester, change it. But they were there to learn how to be directors. And at the end, I said to them, if you feel like you will die if there's if you don't act, then... Because that school is, the school is like $40,000 a yes, year. Yes. And I said, if you feel like you're going to die, if, you don't, if you're not going to be an actor, then yes, go, go take the acting course. But don't waste your parents' money if you're not going to be, don't want to be an actor and you're not right. going to be able to take, like you said, all the rejection and that's all you want to do. I didn't feel like, I didn't look, I don't even look at it as rejection. I don't I never. Either. I don't even use the word that's so negative to think you were rejected. Right. Uh, many times... I look, I'm on the other side of the camera a lot. Many times the best actor doesn't get the part. That's the one who's right for it. That's right. So you walk out of there thinking, I must not be good. But meanwhile, you gave the best audition. You're just not right for it. Exactly. So you forget about it. Right. But then actors think, well, why did they call me in if I wasn't? They saw my resume. They knew who I am. Yeah. Why did they call me in? So they're not thinking that. It was, they just weren't right for I went to, they I, stunk up the room. Right. Catherine, I went to, a, years ago, be, way before Bronx Tale, I went to the network. It was between me and this other guy. And I went to the network and we shot. Whoever got, whoever, this was the last two guys. And I didn't get the part. And, he, and I said, how could that be? I was so much more right for it than the other guy. I really knew I was right for this. Right. And I just forgot about it. And then years later, I ran into one of the producers. In LA, I said, "Hey, how you doing?" He goes, "Hey, Chance, how are you?" We're talking, and he goes, "I got." He goes, "I got to tell you something. Remember that pilot that we did?" You know, I go, "Yeah." He said, "You were the best guy." I said, "Oh well, thanks." I said, "Well, the other guy got it." He goes, "You know why you didn't get it?" I said, "I don't know. I don't know why." I go, "It's a few years ago. It's, not, it's no big deal." He goes, "The head executive producer said." that I was a guy who reminded me, reminded him of the guy that stole his wife. <gasps> wow. So I didn't get the part for Holy that reason. Shit. He said, every time I look at him, he looks just like the guy that when my wife left me for. And I didn't get the part. So I always tell actors, you never know why you're never going to get a part, so don't worry about it. Whoa, that's yeah. original. Yeah. So... It was really great being here with you, uh, going over your whole career, and and could you talk about that new thing, or maybe you shouldn't. I don't. No, think, I you can't. can't. You can't talk about that. Okay, but you'll be, you'll be seeing a in a very very uh, big series, but we can't talk about it now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a secret. It's a secret. We can't talk about it. So, Catherine, how long have you been painting? So I've been painting since I want to say. 93. So is this something, this seems like something you just have to do. This is also something that's uncontrolled, out of my control. Out of your control. It's out of my control. Wow. Now this painting here, what would you say, what is, is there a name for that painting? I don't have a name for it, but it goes with the series of all these women that I had a big show in Brooklyn and her in back of you. Yes. Um, uh, all these women, so there is a, kind of a theme behind it is that, you know, I feel that w women and where we are now with all this body dysmorphia and right. all this shit, people come in and they come to the gallery or they come in my studio and they're like, oh my God, these are so beautiful. And I say, oh yeah, you think, you think she's beautiful? You think this is beautiful? And they go, I think she's so beautiful. And these are s women who are some women that are insecure and don't think they're beautiful. Right. And they have body issues and they use filters or whatever. And I'm saying to myself, this same girl who is has issues with that, 
comes in and looks at this and goes, she's beautiful, she's beautiful, she's beautiful, but they don't see the beauty in themselves. Right. And for me, so I just did it to say, because people look at it and they, they like them. They're like, they're beautiful, I love them. And they're not perfect. Right. But we think they're beautiful. We think this, you know, we think it's beautiful. Right. And, you know, one boob is bigger than the other. Who's heavy? Who's, you know, big nose? I, I purposely made them like that because I wanted to show the point of when you look at art and you may think it's beautiful, but then you look at yourself and you go, well, why wouldn't I be beautiful? I'm far more in proportion than these pieces. Right. Well, so, so that's where the idea of it Yeah, came no, from. I get it. I get it. And it was called The Gathering. The Gathering. Nice. Nice. Now, do you ever get commission to like paint someone they ever come to you and say yeah i you... just got i did a series in in um these old books i was painting uh um portraits in these old books right and i just uh sent one out to california i just sent one out of this guy he's That's great wanted me to do him a pit he sent me the jane austen book it's his favorite jane rye right and he, that's his favorite novel and he sent it to me and he said, will you put my portrait on a page, pick a page. And, and I did it, and he put it in a, um, on a plastic glass, and it's on his coffee table with it open um, to the portrait, you know, his wow. favorite book with his portrait in it. So many people, I, I think De Niro bought one of your paintings, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I bought one, the usual suspect's painting. Yes. So. Uh, and I gave Marty a sculpture. For people who want to look at your paintings and, and maybe purchase them, how do they go about doing that? Well, they Catherine? could go on on Instagram. Yes. On Catherine Narducci artist, just like that, Catherine Narducci artist. Right. And, and they could do it that and way. And they could DM it and, and see, see my see art work. there. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really really great. Well, Catherine, it's been a great time. Thank you. So thank really, you. look, I'm acting up. Thank you so much. Hey, no. thank you too. <laughs> no, uh, seriously, thank you so much. <laughs> For uh, being my first guest on my podcast. Yes. And um, uh, I think you, it, it was just so insightful to hear about your life and your career and uh, your paintings. And again, if somebody wants to look at your paintings, they go to Instagram. Catherine Arducci, artist. Artist. And uh, you're, gonna, you're going to be seeing her and I in Godfather of Harlem this year. We got to convince Chris Broncato. To uh, have the a scene, uh, a scene. bananas and the gigantes go out to the dinner. The bananas and the gigantes. We got to go to the Copa. Know what? I think that'd be a great idea. Right? Yes. They'll have to do the Copa over again. That'd yeah. be great. That'd that would be great. be great. Or was the Copa around? Yes. Are you kidding? Copa was just the height at that time. Oh, wow. In the 60s? Oh, my God. Copa was at the height. Was it in the 50s? We're in the 50s. We're in the 50s and 60s. Copa was the height. Wow. When you played the Copa, you went to the Copa? Wow. Well, we could go up to Harlem and see some jazz. Oh, go to Harlem, the Cotton Club. That would be unbelievable. That would be great. That would be great. Okay. We got to make it happen. We'll make it happen. God bless.